A good city has industry. I, I want you to agree with this statement. It's going to be a challenge to move forward from there. Many habits and assumptions need reversing. Trends need turning around. I'll focus now on London because I know most about it on the ground. You may be familiar with that city, some of you. Here is a typical scene. It's a fast-growing and freewheeling place. And by the way, those red uniforms are all made in Tottenham, in North London. Made by a business who now expect to be pushed out of their city. One of the thousands of victims of a strip-out of the space that's needed to house a burgeoning, super-diverse economy and a failure to build new. We are in the midst in London of a fast demixing process. The arguments in favour of a rich mix that includes industry are not fully shaped yet. Well, they aren't in my head anyway. I hope these two days can help. The following are two dozen fragments. Observations, pieces of jigsaw to help the thinking. A children's book from the 1960s is called Mike and the Model Makers. I came across it by chance from my room at the CAS. I looked down on Whitechapel High Street. I decided one day to have a luxury moment to visit the Whitechapel Gallery and its bookshop over the street. In the deluxe books display case, I saw it. Rachel Whiteread, the sculptor, had found the same book, had it reprinted and remade one of the models, a cement mixer. What is going on when a cool and super successful artist reissues a children's book about a factory in a city, London? The same book I spotted and got excited about. Something is certainly going on. Dad and I visited all the factories and saw how they make the models, the book reads. Six tons of zinc in the factory melted in one go. More than 150 fully automatic die casting machines. Every four seconds the mold opens. 500 women sort out the parts. Each week they make at least 22 million wheels. At the end of the factory, the large containers wait, like Jonah's whale with wide open mouths. These are the toys, of course. There was a building so long, I could not see the other end. <coughs> now I know what Daddy meant when he was talking about the greatest automobile factory in the world. What does happen in all those sheds over there? Look along the Thames, for example, from Raynham. Hiding in there are huge aggregate yards, material stockholders, builders, merchants by the dozen, timber depots, recycling plants in the distance, Britvik, who make Pepsi for London to drink, Tate and Lyle Sugar, the vegetable oil refinery at Erith, the gold ingot manufacturers, taps and magnets. Skip hire, waste transfer, wharves, rail freight, warehouses, including Tesco's, giant new cold stores, businesses working with metal, glass, paper, plastic, power, water treatment, packers and shippers, Ford's diesel engine plant in Dagenham, London's largest factory, over a million engines each year. They're in the process of further increasing production and are growing their workforce to 2,250. Lots of windows, doors, kitchens and wardrobes, foundries and fabricators, metal spinners, turners, millers, punchers, Tilda Rice, the wax people, laboratory glassware, helicopter parts, extruding, plating and coating, salmon, smoking, Whitaker and Sawyer and Mason Pearson making brushes, the pallet people, the makers of garden sheds, ice cream wafers. London's industrial economy 
like that of most cities, is dominated by the everyday support of our lives. It's no small matter, that city-serving economy. It's humdrum, hidden away, but vital. It needs to be near and always evolving. This is closed loop in Dagenham. They set up in London because of its stream of waste. And now they produce food-grade plastic recyclate out of 35,000 tonnes of plastic bottles per year. Five years old, they recently expanded and employ 200 people. The nearby Dagenham gasification plant will turn 180,000 tonnes of waste each year into energy while producing metal, aggregate and glass recyclate. Where's my parcel, my groceries, my bus and my bicycle? Big and small, thousands of depots deliver what we need and what we want. Transport sheds, warehouses, markets for the restaurants, milk for the tea. Here's the fresh from the wrappers, new Waitrose home delivery depot in Coolsdon. We'll be needing many more of those. And the majority of manufacturing businesses in our city are closely linked to the London market, producing just-in-time and bespoke wares ranging from sandwiches and dairy products to metalwork and joinery. All of this can be expected to grow strongly as London's population expands by over a third in the coming decades. Our city will need more, not less, than its current 100 plus steel fabricators and 200 plus printers. We will need more wood workshops, stone and composite board cutters. At the prosaic end of the spectrum, phenomenal growth of air and rail travel via London is also the basis of a large scale ready meal industry. These trends are magnified by the city's increasing prosperity and the burgeoning of interest in local origin. For example, the bespoke tailoring industry has reversed many decades of decline, with the city now boasting well over 40 such businesses, the world's greatest concentration. We eat a lot of bread. Bakeries are a good example of a just-in-time production industry that is expanding in the city while the businesses nuance in response to diversifying customer demands. High volume bakeries such as Warburton's, Hovis and Allied are all growing their London facilities. Warburton's are the most impressive with their 10 year old premises in Edmonton, now having had 70 million pounds worth invested. Running around the clock throughout the year producing 23,000 loaves per hour, 3 million items per week, 300 people are employed there. Meanwhile, with blossoming appetite for craft baked bread, the number of smaller wholesale bakeries has been increasing to about 130 currently. Now brands such as Paul's, La Dure, Conditor and Cook and Blackbird Bakery have all become significant producers in London. The eating itself problem, speaking of bread. Now here's where it gets difficult, very difficult. Yes, there is a great deal of industry in London. The prospects for it are good. It's growing from within. Decline is now only a memory. But all is not well. Competition for space is intense. London is eating itself. That's not good. Housing growth is stripping out the capacity for a flexible and vibrant everyday economy right across the city. We are now seeing an accelerated suburbanization of much of London beyond the center, a shrinking of chances an increasing mismatch between the city's vibrancy and its physical fabric. To give you a feel of what I'm on about, in the last two years, the outer London boroughs have lost 10% of their office space to residential. 
Two-thirds of it was occupied, displacing 33,000 jobs. Over 14 years, the whole city has lost 16% of its industrial space. Vacancy rates are now below what is generally seen as desirable. We have gone rapidly from surplus to shortage. And yet, permissions still to be realized and emerging local planning strategies could allow a further 10% to be lost. That could squeeze out activity that generates over 40,000 jobs. London's little mayor and his strategic authority have been relaxed about this strip out of non-residential accommodation throughout the city, such as the mayor's London plan team do not have a very sophisticated overview. The projections they are using seem flimsy, not rooted in knowledge gathered on the ground. This is a normal type of situation, of course. Overview people often don't get to grips with what there is. The starting point should be to look at what we have got in our city, in your cities too, to see all that as a lucky find of remarkable diversity. In London, we still have a miraculously filigree configuration, but rapidly becoming less so. 65% of London's jobs, so let's call that well over half its economy, is currently outside the centre. There, beyond the centre, 54% of the jobs are in what we call high street places. And, often dovetailed alongside, 16% of the jobs are in industrial areas. In London, 16% gets you to a big number, 450,000 jobs. Add in those high street places and the figure gets to 1.9 million. It is therefore no small matter to be so carelessly allowing that city to shrink its stock of accommodation for non-residential uses, to erode its fine latticed mix, and to be so weak on pushing for new space. People move faster than buildings, it is not viable to build a big city from scratch. It just doesn't stack up. The economy and the civic life of cities rely on a vast stock of buildings constructed over many decades, generations in fact, the majority of which have been paid for long ago and can therefore be available, flexible, affordable. But if demand for an alternative use becomes all-conquering, particularly if that use is as vast as housing for millions of people, then there is a big problem. If that demand is allowed to have its way, cornered into attack mode by half a planning system, then the city's economy and its shared life will start to be constricted, have its opportunities curtailed, part of the economy will start to migrate away, since the economy can always respond to pressures more readily than the stock of buildings. The process is rough, often aggressive. Archway sheet metal, a 25-person manufacturing business making kebab cooking machines and such things. In the way of a blundering change plan that local government, city mayor and gangsteresque football club are sponsoring up in Tottenham. They've been treated like dirt, their factory arson attacked and then compulsorily purchased, struggling to survive. Our city continues to treat its industry with contempt. Gravel. Seeing the polar rose from the new cable car over the Thames, unloading gravel for concrete production at Mohawk Wharf brings a smile. A reminder 
of the robustness of the industrial life of our cities. Much manages to survive against the odds. The history of that one is for another day. It's a history of evictions, expropriations, and more fire starting. The Pryor family and their aggregate boats in the 1980s had experiences much like the Joseph family of archway sheet metal with their kebab machines today. And yet the Polar Rose is the next generation battling on, newly bought. Pushing back is a new dynamic, fresh demand. Here's a taster. Plenty of us will have fond memories of making model airplanes, ships and assorted military machines from plastic kits, painting them with humbrol enamel paint in mini tins. Long made in the north of England, a few years ago they shifted production to China, like people did. <coughs> However, exasperated by quality and delivery problems, they recently put out a call for a UK contract manufacturer. Now it's made by Rustins in their small Cricklewood factory, North London. This is part of a major trend to reshore, to localise production. Niche. London's ever-expanding concentration of people who are interested in luxury and many who combine enthusiasm for a metropolitan lifestyle with high technical or creative skill and entrepreneurial drive is also having an effect on manufacturing in the city. Four paint manufacturers, six gun makers, one tray and trolley manufacturer, and three brush makers, for example, seemed anachronistic until recently. But now they're each reviving and repositioning. New companies are emerging alongside Dunhill, Hanson and Tanner, Kroll were amongst the few surviving branded London producers of luxury leather goods. But now they've been joined by at least 15 newer producers such as Tallowin, Bill Amberg, Frank Horn and Thomas Light. These businesses are flourishing, not just because of the London market for goods, which could be served from elsewhere, but also because the people with the desire and the skill to produce want to be there. The city's much denuded garment manufacturing capabilities, hooked to its spectacularly vibrant design scene, are now providing a fertile base for growth. Clothing brands have been the fastest to embrace Made in London as a major asset and volumes produced are increasing, with many garment makers now more willing to celebrate their provenance and to have a web presence, my goodness. It is possible to identify around 100 workrooms, including eight I know of making shirts and 18 making shoes. While once it might have seemed just quirky that military dress uniforms are produced in Tottenham, and ceremonial hats in Forest Hill, where I live. Now it seems to be an indicator of London's exciting potential for manufacturing growth, as is the chance survival of four mannequin makers, 50 precision engineering workshops, six metal spinners, four lift manufacturers and ten foundries. Food production has been the fastest to evolve capitalising on the strength it has long gained from a culturally diverse population with many immigrant communities. Following the craft beer and coffee roasting phenomenon, London now has new distilleries, doubling its count to six, soft drink producers, now there are four, and a dozen new chocolate makers, plus a huge number of niche caterers and food pre-preparers. Meanwhile, caterum are booming making these cars, and so are Brompton making bicycles. Furniture production that seemed doomed just a few years ago is growing once again. And now there are around 130 small-scale makers and, of course, as you know, four thriving umbrella manufacturers. <coughs> I got sucked into understanding this manufacturing scene 
an understanding no one else has, strangely. A small proportion of London's industry, of course, manufacturing is, but particularly captivating, with the potential to help win people around. People like it. I've been making a list of makers. You should all have a go in your own cities. It's now got past 2,200. Those engines, bread, paint, cola. Hundreds and hundreds. Yet people have been telling us it is extinct. Well, London is likely to lose a few more large process plants. Indeed, a couple are to close this year. But the job losses involved are not massive. Nestle are closing their Hayes coffee factory soon, shedding 230 jobs. And closure of InBev's Stag Brewery in Mortlake will involve 180 job losses. These are neat examples of what's happening with London's manufacturing. While it had seemed likely a few years ago, after InBev first announced the closure of Mortlake, that we would become a one brewery city, Fuller's at Chiswick. In fact, over 30 new brewers have emerged with a handful, such as Meanwhile, Meantime, sorry, already upscaling. The jobs generated thus far by these generously exceeds the loss of InBev from London. Likewise, the rapid growth of small coffee roasters, so that now London has more than two dozen wholesale roasteries, looks set to more than compensate for the loss of Nestle. Let's make things, say the people with beards. New enthusiasm for making is spreading, leading to a strengthening of this dynamic. Who could have predicted the burgeoning of urban wooden spoon producers around the world? Bizarre, but indicative. Here's one of the open workshops that are helping this popularization. Black Horse Workshop in Walthamstow. From nothing, just over 50 have sprung up in recent years. Not long ago, I went to Belfast. 5,000 people work in the Bombardier aircraft factory there. It's big on the horizon when you land at the airport. That's why I looked it up. It started as Shorts Brothers, at the start making hot air balloons. Here they are next to Battersea Gasworks, London, in a railway arch. We can trace hundreds of such stories in history and in the present. We need industry in the city because cities are our most innovative places, the seedbed for a constant diaspora. This is a good thing. The economy, I just want to remind you all, is what we all share what we do to support each other, it happens when we want it and how we want it. So what happens when the people who are the economy choose to be in the city? Right now, we are starting to be confronted by the fact that many of the people who start up and push forward businesses these days don't want to drive in cars to places behind trees and shrubs in the fields. They have a metropolitan spirit, and the city must now make space for all the enterprise they give life to. We here all agree, I think, that we want a mixed city. That's an increasingly popular view. Yet we have a type challenge. How to achieve not just greater density, but more mix? Why can't we intermix? Why can't we embed? We should. We need to. Industrial use needs to become a component of new development. We must devise new ways of incorporation. Building types and configurations need to evolve. 
fresh guidance and encouragement is needed, some leadership and cash help would speed it along. Well, we must decide what configurations make a good city, what type of city we want to shape. The London plan, a turgid thing, is still stuck with old ideas about the geography of the economy and the place of industry. It implies that a city with just a handful of consolidated, large and nicely segregated industrial estates would be a good city. That plan still advocates the strip out of smaller working areas, especially ones that are embedded within or adjoining high streets. Nowhere in that plan that the mayor produces is there acknowledgement that industrial uses are remarkably diverse, often blur into the worlds of civic, community, retail and office and operate at many scales. Nowhere is there mention of the varied relationships between industrial uses and the people employed, the entrepreneurialism that drives growth and of the markets served. A very different version of a good city could be argued for. That good city would not only have the larger industrial areas, preferably well joined in to the city's continuity, but also a filigree of industrial spaces everywhere. I would advocate that every one of London's 600 high streets should include accommodation suitable for industrial use as part of the mix. There needs to be strong action to achieve this welcoming and accommodating geography. Be off with your charter of Athens. Mr Abercrombie's dreadful post-war plan and its current rehash. This is the 21st century, no longer the 20th. It's good to get involved on the ground too, if you don't mind getting your hands dirty, I would encourage it. For me it was a happy accident. I went to buy a tray from a small stalwart of urban manufacture. A few months later it became a two family business, my family and Mr Schreiber's family. We make trays in aluminium, beautiful ones, I think. It started in the basement of the Schreiber family radio shop in the 1930s, became k in 1947. It's a classic story of city enterprise. We are seeing the sharp end of the space squeeze. We were pushed out from where we were to make way for a housing estate. In the summer, we moved the factory to behind Asda on the old Kent Road. We should celebrate our industrial economy, reveal it. I've been having a little go. The From Around Here shop that we did a few years ago in Tottenham, showing off what's made there, catching the eye on the high road. Costumes, mirror balls, and here, for example, with students exposing the depth and the breadth of Waltham Forest's economy, including its embattled industry, discovering listing, mapping. It's time to speak up on this matter, I say. I have been starting that linked to our small cast cities venture. Working with people like Lucy Rogers doing superb drawings of businesses who are being kicked. Encouraging social media interest. Here's an exhibition about the threatened economy of London's Lee Valley. Stories, facts. A week ago I started posting on Instagram, things made in London. Umbrella from Shirley, sports car from Slade Green, tower scaffold from Bellingham, coffee trike from Leighton, briar pipe from Walthamstow, aluminium jar from Thamesmead. The message goes like this. We are a few Londoners who believe that manufacturing is a vital part of our city, indeed of any good city, that should be visible, understood, 
celebrated and nurtured. Cities are the home of innovation and entrepreneurialism, a great crucible of the new. That includes making, now on the up, popular and viable once more. It is time to embrace production in the metropolis, to realise that we need it and shout out that we want it. But all is not roses. Fast growth and an insatiable demand for housing is hollowing out some of what make this city most interesting. London is eating itself an unfortunate side effect of success. Manufacturing's economic diversity, its depth and breadth, is especially fragile, under threat from a fast-moving land market and the floppiness of planning. This is why we are busy persuading and promoting. Barbara Wilson in Wood Green is one of the hundreds of businesses that could expect to be pushed aside if their council, Haringey Council, if their draft plan is not amended. They've been manufacturing brassware and water fittings for over 100 years. They are one of the three royal warrant holding manufacturers. That's quite an honour in Haringey. Borough that are threatened by their council's plan. I have been busy raising the alarm with others, arguing for a more subtle approach to intensification, encouraging others to get involved, and initiating and feeding into <coughs> media coverage of the issue. It started to make it onto the television news, the radio, and here a superb article by Rowan Moore in the Observer and Guardian newspapers. To get a four-page article like this in one of the national quality newspapers must help. Awareness is being raised. The call for increasing, not losing, London's mix can be a popular call. So that's my go at it. We must be clear about the city we want. We need to shout out that a good city has industry and not hidden away but embraced, extrovert, noticed. A good city can accommodate its messy as well as its neat, its bakers, printers and upholsterers, its local distributors and repairers, as well as its giant storage buildings and yards, its hobby makers and its startups, as well as its established manufacturers, services and suppliers. A good city should embrace its aggregates, its builders, merchants, its waste, reuse, and its just-in-time production. Its hirers, its showmen, its stockholders and deliverers. A good London would be proud of its many hundred car menders, would recognize their skill and their vibrancy. It would be proud of Ford and Caterham, Brompton and Mylands, Tate and Lyle and Dunhill, the Tesco, Sainsbury's and Asda depots, the Yodel, UPS and parcel force sheds, the scrap metal, glass and paper, the jewellery and leather goods crafters, the dressmakers, cleaners, scaffolders, the metal fabricators. The city we want would let us see all these things, walk past them on the way to elsewhere, appreciated and respected, <coughs> as much as the schools and the shops, the healthcare and the eating. In the city we want, we would know about the diversity of industry, perhaps choose to enter that world because it is normal and every day. Choose to help make it stronger and therefore our city the richer. Thank you for listening to me.